If young Saul Hudson had never earned the nickname Slash, if he had never met Axl Rose or never joined Guns N' Roses, if he had never looked like he was born with a cigarette nailed to his lips, he'd still be a pretty fascinating guy. But all that other stuff, that's pretty awesome too. Slash grew up in LA. His dad designed album covers. His mom designed costumes for the likes of John Lennon and David Bowie. Surrounded by music, it wasn't long before Slash became a rock and roll icon himself. In an era of hair metal bands, GNR, with lots of hair, managed to sound authentic. The perfect mix of gutter and glam. They knew how to behave like rock stars off stage as well. A mix of ego and drugs and debauchery, well, they pretty much destroyed the band. So last month, GNR inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but Axel rejected the honor and didn't show. And while Slash says he would have loved to play that show with a reunited GNR, he's got plenty to keep him busy. A new band, a new solo record called Apocalyptic Love, and after the drama of GNR and his subsequent group Velvet Revolver, he finds himself in a stable band for the first time in a long while. So is it possible for him to be at peace and still totally rock? No, I was just thinking so that that particular song is really great. It's such a great song. It's, yeah, every time I hear it. Well, we we're just waiting in the in the bio. It was a, a crazy. It's such a yeah. great track out there. Um, uh, welcome back. You got another record. That's got to be really exciting. Yeah, it came happened pretty quickly. <laughs> was it was it part of the plan? Did you know you were going to make a, a, this kind of? Well, you know, um, during the tour, you know, the, the the band was so great, and I was like, if I was going to do another record, I'd do it with these guys, you know. And then when the tour was over, it came back and put it all together. Miles is the, is the guy who's fronting this band, who was on your other record, right? Yeah. So this is the interesting thing about your, your choice. So you, obviously, you know, your, your first big band, you had this, you know, this volatility. Then you have Velvet Revolver, there's volatility. Then you make a record with a bunch of different singers, right. which is, ha, brings its own kind of instability to it. actually gave me a whole new lease on singers. Did it? Yeah, they were all just a, a pleasure to work with. You're like, and oh, it's just changed my attitude, you know. <laughs> it's good. That's one of the th great things about working with a lot of people is you learn to, you, you know, you learn that people, by and large, are all great. Yeah. And then also you can, you learn to adapt to different personalities and different working styles and so on. It helps you grow as a person and as a musician. I guess you're right, because you, your experience with singers is, is, is one kind and much talked about. Mm -hmm. So in, when you get into this environment, you see all these different singers play out, then you kind of create this stable band right. with this singer. So, so it, all those songs when you and Miles sat down to write, I mean, chemistry is important. Right. What was it like to try to make records together? Well, I mean, it started with that first couple songs that we did from the last record where he came into the studio and he was just this, <clears throat> you know, very mild-mannered, very sort of laid-back, cool dude, you know? Not sort of full of himself and not that whole big presentation that goes with some singers, right? And so from that moment on, the tour just went great. And I was like, these are the guys that, that I should make a real rock record with. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking about how, um, you know, people who follow music these days say, how come music isn't like it used to be? And I think there's lots of great music today, but there's certainly a culture that seems to be missing. And the more and more I read about your childhood, the more I thought, the 70s don't exist anymore. No, <laughs> And that gone. was really what... I think created a lot of the, the space for guys like you to develop. I mean, even your community as a kid, your neighbors and who your parents worked with, like you were well, around that was the a great big influence on me for sure. Yeah, let's show two. I'm gonna show you these album covers here. This is this is a connection to this last year. Let's put one up here. Oh, so oh, yeah. We got this Joni Mitchell record, right? <clears throat> I mean, right. Th and then we have this one as well. Show the next one. Ringo Starr right. album. I mean, those are both connected I to your. I remember that suit. <laughs> yeah, and why do you remember that? Because my mom put it together and she painstakingly put every single one of those little sequence in my hand, yeah. and it was a long, arduous process that seemed to take an eternity. And so there you are connected <laughs> to a, a Beatle album cover. Yeah. <laughs> and, and what about the Joni Mitchell one? Well, um, my dad, let's see, my mom made her all her clothes, and my dad did her album covers, like th three or four of them. So she was a pretty close friend of the family, an amazing uh, artist. And she lived close to you guys, right? Yeah, like down the street. Well, that's the thing. Like when you were a kid, Bowie used to come to your house. Well, that was a different neighborhood. A different neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> that was later on, because that was my mom was dating him, and so that was after my mom and dad split up. So did that was. A... You knew he was Bowie. Like, did you understand who Bowie was at the time? I knew him from the album covers. <laughs> <laughs> 
No, I mean, I liked his music, and, and it was an interesting time. I had to have been, like, um, roughly eight, maybe nine years old, you know, so it was sort of like, and they were never home. They came, they came by the house every so often, he would come over. But, uh, you know, they were always off sort of running around. But I went to a few Bowie shows as a result, you know, so that was cool. That's amazing. <laughs> um, that's got to really influence your worldview, though, just being around all that, doesn't it? Well, it, it, you, know, it, um, I, you know, at the time, no. I didn't pay much attention to it. It's just when you're a kid, you just go with the flow. And then as I got older, um, then I started to realize that a lot of stuff that I'd learned had sort of prepared me to deal with a lot of the stuff that I was dealing with at the present. Right. And, uh, uh, yeah, I, I'd have to say I have to attribute some of the sort of... Um, way that I handle things, just having been around it before. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're the only guy I know who's actually really charming about flatlining three times in your life. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, the fact that you're, when you, when you, when you have a chance to sort of laugh about it, yeah. it's better to laugh about it than <laughs> anything else. <laughs> That's really true. Uh, I know the, the, the GNR Rock and Roll Hall of Fame thing is pretty cool, <clears> but what I think is really, aside from it's awesome that the, you're talking 25 years of Appetite for Destruction, which is amazing, mm -hmm. is that you're going in the Hall of Fame with the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and didn't you go to school with Flea? With Flea, yeah. Like, high school? Yeah, high school, junior high, actually. Like, and who, both, both. Who would have known that these two dudes walking down the hallway? Well, the funny thing about Flea, and, and uh, he actually did play on the last record. We did a song with him and Alice Cooper and Steve Adler, and... Flea and Steven and myself all lived within a certain amount of block radius. And so before any of us picked up an instrument, well, picked up the instrument that we ended up playing professionally, we all knew each other from the block, you know? Yeah, I mean, and obviously you guys would never have been a million years, said, you know, in 25 years, 30 years, whatever, we're going we're gonna to have no. this. Yeah. <laughs> what, what do you make of the, of the 25 years of appetite? It, you know, it's, 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 uh, it doesn't feel like it was that long ago, but um, at the same time, you know, it feels like a lifetime ago. It's weird. So, it's it, it's it, it's a really great honor, but at the same time, it's it's it hasn't sunk in yet. You know, like I mean, I remember I first heard about the whole Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the 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 fact that we were going to be eligible in 2007 when Guns uh, Velvet Revolver played in place of Van Halen for their induction, and uh, somebody had said, you know, you're going to be eligible and seven or five years and I was like you know sort of like wow yeah right and I put it out of my mind so when the nomination came it was pretty heavy that was that was when it felt the most special yeah, it's got to be a cool place because so much water is passed under the bridge and there's obviously whatever personal stuff that went on but for the public that record meant a lot to them right yeah and it's 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 sort of a drag because we're not going to get together and play you won't do it eh? well I mean I would yeah. but it's just the way that's working out I think it's amazing when you tweeted both the birthday to Duff McKagan and you called him the redhead you just said happy birthday <laughs> that was the funniest tweet ever. How different would this world of rock and roll have been had you actually joined Poison? Because you tried out for Poison? That wouldn't have lasted long. No? No, that was, I have, to, I have to say it was part of my sort of opportunistic way of dealing with things. At the time, I was looking for a gig, and those guys, uh, the original guitar player was a friend of mine, and so he went back to Pennsylvania, and he said, you know, you should take that gig, because they were the biggest band in L.A. at well, the he time. Had a, he had a, a girlfriend yeah. was pregnant, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I was like, I, you know, I mean, I, normally I hate poison, you know, but, but maybe just for a second. So I, I, you know, went down there, and I played the shit out of their stuff, but there was no way I was going to wear those kind of clothes. Well, I, I heard that, I heard that, that Bobby Dahl actually asked you, like, what are you going to wear? So he goes, are you going to, what kind of shoes are you going to wear? Because I was wearing moccasins at the time, and that rubbed me the wrong way, in and of itself. But I knew it was, it was, it was, uh, an ill-fated, you know, attempt when I, when I was leaving and CC walked in because CC was came in dressed for the part, yeah, yeah. and I just I knew that second, you know. Well, it's amazing how important to certain bands Flash really is. Well, that you know, I mean, all things considered, there's uh, a lot of bands that that you know, the Dolls, and, uh, and Kiss and Motley Crue and um, David Bowie for you know, I mean, a lot of people sort of have these uh, you know, iconic sort of kind of looks that, that have made them really famous and taking chances doing that. I don't think Poison's one of them, but um, at the same time, that was what their whole shtick was. The only problem with the bands that were sort of jumping on that parade in the 80s is that most of them didn't have any musical background or soul, <laughs> you know, which, is really cool. which is, yeah. Well, in a weird way, um, I mean, people would recognize you by a silhouette, right? Because you have that iconic look now, but it seems like it's a look that's yours. 
as opposed to the one that you put on. People would know a silhouette of Slash anywhere it was. Really? Was that part of the plan? <laughs> no, I just thought, I mean, I really, when it comes down to it, it, it was not a what you call a fabricated kind of a thing. It was just whatever you throw together, and that's sort of an everyday kind of the way that... that but I think the hat made it different. Sure. Yeah. But I think that's one of the reasons why you it didn't seem fab for your career. You've been able to pop in and out of different rooms and bands. I mean, you're one of those guys who was around the Michael Jackson world. Right. I mean, what don't we what don't we know about that world that you know? Um, about Michael's, I mean, Michael, uh, you know, I mean, I, I only knew him on a, for the most part, a professional level. I don't even think when he attempted to be any closer than that, I even allowed it because it just it's too crazy. You know, there's there's being famous and then there's being that kind of famous, and that's that's a crazy world to be in because you have no sense of reality. And you can see that from the outside because I'm I was close enough at that point because. Guns N' Roses was probably the biggest stadium rock band at the time. And then you have Michael, who was the sort of Elvis Presley of the period. And he's like, that's a scary thing. <laughs> <laughs> and he was just dealing with it. And I felt for him because he, as an artist, one of the genius artists, uh, most genius artists I'd ever really been around next to maybe Ray Charles and a couple other guys. And, uh, and you know, sort of stuck in this world where nobody is real you know nobody will talk to him in a, in a real fashion everybody's sort of around him so they can gain something from him and so on and so forth it's a very lonely situation so i wondered if you ever had a small version of that when you tried to put together a new band because you are slash so um did you ever experience that kind of thing where people weren't talking to you like a real person well i mean i've i've I th you know i mean most of these guys are you know most of the people i surround myself with even if, if uh, I hadn't been in a band with them a long time. I've, been, I've known them for a long time. So there's certain elements of that, um, but not to the extent where Michael was, you know. All right, stick around. We're going to find out uh, if one of his obsessions still remains true. Anthropology with Slash when we come back. Anthropology. <laughs> you guys, you guys, we've got oh, some bad not, news. Not really Slash is. isn't real. Miss? What? Oh, I've never Slash seen Slash isn't this. real. He's a made-up person that represents care and giving, and people dress up like him and lie to their kids. Slash is make-believe! Here, look for yourself. He's based on a fable of a Dutch saint named Wunterslaus. Wunterslaus? What? But then, who played at my eighth birthday party? One of our parents. But then, who was the guitar player for Guns N' Roses? One of our parents. <laughs> Are you f***ing serious? That's awesome, man. That is awesome. Have you, you haven't seen that before? No, I heard about it. I heard about it, but I've never seen it. Making South Park's got to be pretty yeah. kind. I mean, that's a huge honor. No kidding. Yeah. Let's play some anthropology, man. Let me rapid fire some things towards you. My kids are going to come back to me about that. Are they about South Park? They're not real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, sometimes they am. So I suppose you really are like Santa. How are you able to be in so many places at once? The older you get, the more you seem to be doing. Yeah, I'm a busybody. You know, I think, you know what it is, is ever since... Uh, I, I got sober. I, I put all my energy that I used to put into drinking and drugs mm -hmm. back into music. So I'm always jamming and just open for opportunities and stuff. And I like, like I said earlier, I like to work with a lot of different people and sort of keeps you humble and, and you learn a lot. Is it is it like a new lease on life? Being, um, what, being sober? Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, I'm not the preachy sort. It, it's But it's been good for me because... Uh, you know, I was I was getting to that point where <clears throat> it starts to take over, and I wasn't getting anything done. And even more importantly, was I wasn't being able to interact to be able to do the things that I wanted to do because no one would take me seriously, because I represented this character, which was just like you know. And so anybody who wanted to work with me thought it was a free ticket to go party. <laughs> and I even as <laughs> up as I might have been, I was always dead serious. And so I started attracting, like, musicians that were just, like, come on board so they could hang out, you yeah, know. That's got to suck. So I, it took a long time, but finally I got to the point where it just wasn't, you know, I wasn't getting anything fun out of it. It wasn't entertaining. Did you come to that realization? Did people around you tell you you were becoming a cliche? No, I'm, I'm one of those people that doesn't listen to anybody. <laughs> so it took, it took me to, to, to get there. All right. All right, so... Um... When you first started talking, did you have a British accent? Yeah. You did? My mom just played me a tape of it. Uh, somewhere, I think I was like around 17 years old, and she said, I got this cassette. And she played it, and I had this really thick northern British accent. It's funny. That's amazing. A little did kid, you, you know, I was like five. Were you consciously trying to lose the accent, or did it just go away? Well, when I, when I moved to the States, I think I was... Um, 
such sort of in public school such an outcast because I was so different from all the other kids because I had the long hair and it seemed like with all the hippie musicians that we knew none of the schools that I went to any of their kids went to so you know what I mean yeah. so I was in this really straight world and I just never really fit in so I think I, I, I consciously was trying to straighten my accent out just to be a little bit more you know, to fit in or whatever. No, absolutely. Um, so I, I know that you had this, you used to really love pinball machines and you've unloaded them. I still them. do. How many, do you, do you still have a bunch? I still have, um, I have three in the house and I rotate them. So I probably have about, in total, maybe nine or ten. Um, do you have a, a, a prize piece? Uh, you know, not really prize, but my favorite one, um, even though I have a lot, a lot of cool ones and eclectic ones, my favorite functional one is the Adams Family. That's all right. It's just one of the best pinball machines ever made. Dude, I downloaded the Slayer pinball app and it's dominant. It's pretty cool. It's I know. so cool. <laughs> There's an ACDC one as well. It's so amazing. Every time you hear the scream, I'm in, I'm in. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you were to, let's say, in a Scientology way, you were going to start a new religion devoted entirely to guitars, <clears throat> who would be your holy trinity? Oh, come on. That's a, that's a tough question. I mean, uh, you know, obviously you'd put, put Jimmy Page in there. Um, I'd probably put Albert King in there. And... Um, Pete Townsend. I don't know. It's a toss-up. Pete Townsend. But, but you know, that's really limiting me to to Rock. just na well, yeah, but also nailing down. To, well, I could put Segovia in there, and that would be great. You know, let's, we'll trade Jimmy Page for Segovia just for this one for for this conversation. That's okay. Um, you know, before you were, you were talking about the idea of sitting in a hotel room, where you're talking about the idea of, of of battling addiction or whatever and dealing with it. There's always been this myth that creativity comes out of chaos, and uh, you know, you you have to be screwed up or you have tension in a band. Look, for a guy who's lived it a lot, mm. is that true? I don't think so. I mean, um, I, I've had moments, you know, tense moments that have produced something on a creative level that are pretty cool. But by and large, I feel more comfortable being creative when I feel really comfortable and at peace with whoever I'm working with. And that makes me way more creative than the opposite. So I don't adhere to that myth myself. I had Robert Plant on the show, and we were talking actually off stage, and he was talking about for songwriters sometimes as they get older, they don't write lyrics as much because they may not have the things to say and they're not sure what they want to say at a certain stage of their career. For a guitarist, do you ever, not run out of riffs, but does it change when you get older, the kinds of riffs you feel like playing? Or you no, can... I think it, it probably gets better, especially for me, because um, in this context, I, we're having a conversation, but I'm a relatively mute person, <laughs> and I don't express myself verbally. And so I, I, you know, I internalize most everything. So I, I express it musically. So that gives me... Uh, an endless wealth <laughs> of emotional stuff to say on the guitar. So I think I'll be doing that, you know, for as long as I'm breathing. Internalizing is, can be really tough if you don't have the outfit, uh, Yeah, right? I, I definitely. God knows what kind of trouble I'd be in if it weren't for guitar <laughs> playing, right? Well, congrats on the Hall of Fame. Congrats on the, uh, the, the Appetite uh, anniversary. It's, it's just survival in and of itself an accomplishment right. for anybody. And congrats on the new record, man. Well done. Uh, cheers. Good to Thank see you. you. Thank you so much. Flash, everybody. Apocalyptic Love is the name of the brand new record. We'll be right back. Slash grew up in L.A. His dad designed album covers. His mom designed costumes for the likes of John Lennon and David Bowie. Surrounded by music, it wasn't long before Slash became a rock and roll icon himself. In an era of hair metal bands, GNR, with lots of hair, managed to sound authentic. The perfect mix. If young Saul Hudson had never earned the nickname Slash, if he had never met Axl Rose or never joined Guns N' Roses, if he had never looked like he was born with a cigarette nailed to his lips, he'd still be a pretty fascinating guy. But all that other stuff, that's pretty awesome too. Of gutter and glam. They knew how to behave like rock stars off stage as well. A mix of ego and drugs and debauchery, well, they pretty much destroyed the band. So last month, GNR inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but Axel rejected the honor and didn't show. And while Slash says he would have loved to play that show with a reunited GNR. No, I was just thinking that, that that particular song is really great. It's such a great song. It's, yeah, every time I hear it. Well, we were just waiting in the in the bio. It was a, a crazy. It was such a yeah. great track out there. Um, he's got plenty to keep him busy. A new band, a new solo record called Apocalyptic Love, and after the drama of GNR and his subsequent group Velvet Revolver, he finds himself in a stable band for the first time in a long while. So, is it possible for him to be at peace and still totally rock? Yeah. Yeah. 